So we've arrived in Almada, and if you come to Almada, this is undoubtedly where you'll get dropped off because this is the ferry terminal. It's also the bus terminal, the tram terminal. It's a major transportation depot here. Um, but the ferries land right here from Lisbon. You pick it up at Caixa de Sodra. It's 15, 20 minute uh, ferry ride, and you're right here in Almada. So it's super convenient. Um, thing about Almada is not, it's, it's not really a tourist attraction per se because there's not a lot here. There's mostly a bedroom community for folks who commute over to Lisbon. So if you come down here like on a weekday at 8 o'clock, 8.30, these ferries are jammed with commuters who are heading over to Lisbon. But people do come here to see the sights like we're going to do today, go to uh, Cristo de Rey, go to the restaurant from uh, Somebody Feed Phil, stuff like that. So there are people who come here, tourists, to see this, mostly Portuguese and Germans, I find. Not too many Americans come over here. But it is a really cool town, and there's a super interesting history. This area, when you come to Portugal, you'll hear a lot about how the Romans came here. And they make it sound like the Romans were the first people here, but they weren't. There were tribes here of Portuguese people before that. And the Phoenicians, 2,700 years ago, seven centuries before the Romans showed up, they were right here in Almada and all over this area, um, fishing and processing fish. This was a huge industry and the Romans learned from the Phoenicians how uh, valuable it was to process fish in this area, in Almada, in Setubal, in Lisbon. All of these places have Roman ruins where they were processing fish, salting fish, preserving fish. So that was going on with the Romans, which you hear a lot about. You don't hear nearly as much about the Phoenicians, but they were here 700 years before the Romans were which is what makes this a really interesting place. So we're going to uh, head today to uh, Cristo de Rey. I've got a nice little walk planned for us and we'll see if we can uh, grab some food while we're here as well. We're making our way to the Cristo de Rey from Almada and this is another abandoned building along the waterfront here, actually a series of buildings. This used to be a fish processing plant and you can see why we're right on the water. Uh, this part of Portugal is littered with abandoned fish processing uh, warehouses like this. Uh, they would can the fish or just get ready, get ready to uh, sell it to the market or whatever. And you can see, so we're right on the river, and you can see there's little railroad tracks behind me. So they were getting ready, man, to move this stuff, to move this stuff out. Now it's just uh, folks hanging out, got their poles sitting in the water. Trying to, uh, trying to catch some lunch, I guess. But um, I don't know, a lot of people go up and over to get to the Cristo de Rey. I really prefer this walk along the waterfront. It's much more characteristic and in my opinion, much more beautiful way to get to Cristo de Rey. This is the Quinta de Alrialva. This is an abandoned winery on the way to the Cristo de Rey monument. And a lot of people, if you read guidebooks, you read stuff online, people will tell you, if you're gonna walk up to Cristo de Rey, it's a really ugly walk. You go through industrial areas, you go through just residential, uninteresting residential areas. But if you take this route along the water and kind of snake your way back up behind the Cristo de Rey, it's a much more interesting walk. A little further up, there's a nature trail, um, not a formal nature trail, but that's what it is back there. And then there's this, which is an abandoned winery. Um, this was a winery for years and years, and you can see why it was successful. They're right on the river, so they had access to shipping. They could ship their wine from here over to Lisbon, throughout Portugal, really, if they wanted to. So this was operational as a winery for decades, but then it was abandoned and sat derelict for years. They tried to revive it a little. They used to have like underground electronic music festivals here like 20, 25 years ago. And now they're trying to revive it again, turn this into a heritage trail, maybe rehab some of these buildings. But for now, it's sitting here crumbling. And if you're interested in crumbling abandoned urban architecture, 
this is a great place to come. I find it fascinating because I just look at this and think, what must this have been like when it was in its heyday, when they were cranking out wine? There are so many buildings back here. All the stuff that must have been going on here is fascinating. So if you come, it's worth your time, but um, disclaimer, I'm not gonna take responsibility if you get hurt, uh, be careful, because it is literally falling apart. I'm walking around and there are holes in the pavement that drop down 15, 20 feet. You could really get severely injured if you're not keeping your eyes open. There are rooftops that you can get on here that are falling down. I wouldn't get on those for the life of me because it looks like they're on their last legs. But it is a fascinating place to come through and look at and admire and think about what it was like back in the day if you're on your way to the uh, Cristo de Rey. So we made it up to the uh, Cristo de Rey here in uh, Almada. And I guess I should tell you a little bit about this monument because it's pretty interesting. If the statue looks familiar to you, if it looks like the Christ the Redeemer statue from Rio de Janeiro, that's for good reason. There was a bishop from Lisbon who visited Brazil, saw the Christ the Redeemer statue and said, we should get us one of them in Lisbon. And that idea was kicking around for a few decades, but in 1949, the uh, diocese and the people of Portugal said uh, they wanted to build something to thank God for keeping them out of World War II. Portugal was neutral in World War II, so um, saved a lot of lives probably, but it should be pointed out that at the time, they were under dictatorship and Salazar's secret police, they enforced his laws very violently, um, killing people, imprisoning political opponents. It was an ugly time, but they stayed out of World War II, so you weigh those two things against each other. Anyway, in 1949, they said, let's build this statue to thank God for keeping us out of World War II. 1959, they finally completed it, and they had the dedication ceremony. Here in 1959, 300,000 people attended the um, dedication ceremony for the Cristo de Rey. I, I have no idea where they, I mean, this park is a decent size, but 300,000 people, I don't know where they fit them. But anyway, um, this statue is, uh, the pedestal that the statue's on is almost 300 feet. The statue itself is uh, nearly 100 feet. So it's very impressive when you come to Lisbon, even if you don't come here, you can see it from the other side of the river. It's pretty much one of the biggest landmarks for you to be able to see here, but it's worth coming over here and checking it out because it's just, the magnitude of this thing is impressive. We're down here on the promenade. The views are incredible and we're lucky we've got a gorgeous day. Weather's almost always nice in Portugal, but the weather's gorgeous today so we can walk around, enjoy this, and then we're going to go and uh, stand in line and uh, spend eight euros each, take the elevator up to the top and see what the views are like up there. So we'll go do that next. Well, we made it to the top of the Cristo de Rey and you can see behind me is the April the 25th bridge. This is an absolutely stunning view up here. So lots of people come up here, take pictures, take selfies, and just look at the amazing view that you get. Not only can you see behind me with the April 25th bridge and all of Lisbon, but then on this other side, you can look back onto the Setubal Peninsula. It's really quite amazing. I mean, you come to Lisbon and you will climb hills and you will see amazing views of the city and the water, but I don't think it's possible to find a better view than up here. It is absolutely incredible. So I think we're gonna hang up here for a while and just uh, walk around and admire the view because it's definitely worth it after taking that elevator ride. 
This is Amara de Tejo, and this is kind of on the walk back from Cristo de Rey, and I was ready for a snack after doing all that walking around. So uh, we came in here. This is a fine dining restaurant here in Almada. Um, I had, I didn't tape inside, I didn't video inside because they're playing music and if you have music going on in the background in YouTube videos, it kind of uh, screws things up. And so I uh, came out here to record the video, but I'll tell you what I had. Um, I had a uh, sweet potato topped with some fresh cheese and a few uh, sprigs of lettuce on the side and a glass of red wine. Um, it's really nice, very, very good, well prepared. I really liked it a lot. Karen's dish was amazing. She had this uh, fresh goat cheese with nuts and raisins wrapped in a phyllo dough. And then she had some uh, caramelized onions on the side with a little bit of lettuce too. That was delicious. And she had some white wine that she didn't finish. So she let me finish it. So if you see any lipstick on the rim of the glass here, you'll know whose uh, lipstick that is. But anyway, we are up above here. We're, we're not down on the riverside, we're up above. And this view is, I, I know I keep talking again and again about the views here in Almada, but I just can't get over it. I mean, it's absolutely stunning. I've been to Almada a few times, but we were always down in the old part of town, which you know, isn't quite as interesting as where we are up here. This view is just absolutely gorgeous. And you've got a fine dining restaurant right here. Really, really enjoyed it. And the other thing about this place is, if you don't want to go in and eat, they have a little window <laughs> right on the side of the restaurant. You can go up and you can order a glass of wine. You I'm sure you can't order food there, but um, you can order a glass of wine or they've got, you know, cocktails and things like that and come out here on the terrace and just enjoy it like we're doing here. It's really quite amazing and stunning and I can't recommend it highly enough. Behind me is the Boca de Vento elevator and normally what folks would do is they'd come down here at the bottom, take the elevator up and then snake around walking up to uh, Cristo de Rey. But we finished the Cristo de Rey and we're coming back down. So we're hitting this and then we're going to uh, get over here down by the water and then make our way back to uh, Alfama to get back home. So um, let's go check out this elevator and see what the views are like because they're supposed to be pretty spectacular. So you come off the elevator and it drops you right in this Jardim do Rio, which is the river garden. It's not really a garden. I mean, there's a few trees, there's a green lawn. Um, but what this has is this amazing panoramic view of Lisbon. Now, we're here in the middle of the day, but my understanding is that it is incredible at sunset. I mean, you can imagine behind me, you've got the bridge, and the sun setting behind it and the city must be absolutely incredible. It's pretty nice here in the middle of the day too. A lot of people just hanging out, wandering around, kids playing. So it's a nice spot and a good little uh, resting point along your walk heading to uh, Cristo de Rey or back to Almada like we're doing. So behind me is Porto Final, and if you've ever heard of Almada, it's probably because of Porto Final. In the first season of the Netflix show, Somebody Feed Phil, he dined there. And ever since then, this place has been absolutely jammed with diners. So much so that you really can't get a table unless you make a reservation weeks in advance. So if you're coming to Almada and you want to dine at Porto Final, then make sure you do so several weeks in advance. We've got reservations um, in six weeks and maybe I'll splice us eating there um, into this video. But today, no way, you're not, you're not getting in there. There's also another restaurant right next door, Altiva Tea. And that place also, they get the overflow from Porto Final, always jammed as well. 
you're not getting a table there either. So if you want to dine at Porto Finale, um, they have kind of a weird reservation system. You can't do it online. You have to send them an email and they'll come back and they'll tell you, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, um, that's Porto Finale. You can see why it's so popular. I mean, look at where you get to sit and look at that view right there. It is just amazing. And maybe I'll let you know how the food is if uh, when we come back here for our reservation. But for now, we just get to uh, kind of drool from afar. So I got in our time machine and fast forwarded a couple of weeks to our reservation at Ponto Finale. So you can notice I got my fancy futuristic haircut and we were able to uh, get in here. So if you're coming to Ponto Finale, you might be tempted to just try and walk up, but we got the first reservation of the day at 1230. And even then there were, I don't know, at least 10, 15, maybe 20 people waiting in line, hoping that they could just walk up. So I'd say don't risk it. We talked to our waiter. He said they're booked for the next two months solid. So make your reservation in advance, I guess, is the moral of that story. Uh, we ordered our food and we got a little bit of wine. I've had this wine before. This is, oh, they put a Ponto Final uh, label on it. That's kind of cool. Um, I've had this wine before. It's from Alentejo. So it's a hearty red. It's nice. It goes with, uh, we'll go with our food. Uh, Terrace de Ervidera. Um, it's a nice red. Um, you know, nothing special, but, but it's good. It's good. And of course, you got to get some marinated olives. Mm. That's the way I like those. Lots of garlic, mm. salty, good brininess. It'll go good with the wine. So we'll just wait for our meal to arrive and we'll give that a try. But until then, I mean, could you possibly have a better view, a nicer atmosphere anywhere in uh, the Lisbon area? I think probably not. So we'll just sit here and enjoy this, sip on our wine, look at the bridge, glance over into Lisbon, watch the boats go by, and just wait. So our food is here, and let me tell you what we got. So tempura green beans. A lot of people, when they think of tempura, they think of Japan. And actually tempura originated in Portugal. So if you go to Japan and you ask them about where the tempura came from, if they really know culinary history, they'll tell you, you know, uh, Portugal was trading with Japan. This is one of the things that made the migration from Portugal to Japan. So we got our tempura green beans. Green bean is absolutely massive. Um, roasted potatoes. When I ordered the roasted potatoes, I thought it was going to come kind of like home fries you know, cubed and then uh, browned in the oven. But no, I mean, these are legit roasted potatoes in the oven. We got some tomato rice and then a little salad. Now you might be saying, well, why didn't you get some uh, seafood? Yeah, this place is famous for their seafood and pretty much everyone who comes here gets seafood. Don't eat seafood. So um, that's the reason, but they're very accommodating to uh, folks who don't eat seafood. And so we've got uh, this variety of dishes. So first up, I'm gonna try the tempura. This looks very inviting. It's hot, it's, it's right out of the uh, fryer. So that's nice. Mm. Mm. Crispy and yummy and um, not too greasy. You know how sometimes tempura can be a little bit greasy, so it's nice. And of course, you got the green bean in there, so it gives it some uh, like grassy uh, vegetable flavor in there too. Mm. So that's really nice. Next up, tomato rice. This is a just a traditional Portuguese dish. Oh man, that is really good. So I'm gonna show you the bowl. And you can see it's really soupy in there. It's not like Spanish rice. Um, and that's what makes it nice. It's, um, 
salty, it's got some uh, parsley in there, and then of course you've got the sweetness with the tomato. So this is a really good example of tomato rice. And then we've got our uh, potato, roasted potato. And I can see on the outside on the skin, I don't know if the uh, camera's gonna pick this up, but you can see on the outside, um, they roasted it with the salt and the probably olive oil. So I'm going to imagine this is really crispy and salty and yummy. Mm. That's nice too. You know what I think would be good with that? It's just like a little of this tomato sauce on top. Now, I know probably there's some people who are watching this thinking, rice and potatoes, but you know what? In Portugal, it's a classic meal. Like you go into any taberna, you go into any cafe that serves uh, Portuguese food, and you'll see people eating French fries with a side of rice on it, white rice. You see this everywhere. This is extremely common. So that's nice with the uh, with the um, potato and the tomato sauce on it. All right. So last thing I'm going to do is I just noticed that they uh, serve the tempura with a slice of lemon, and this would be you know typical of any seafood dish that you would get. So it's nice that they include this with the tempura as well. Wow. That really makes it. I like that. I'll, I'll have to, uh, yeah, we'll enjoy that tempura with that lemon. So there you go. Um, Porto Ponto Final. I gotta say, um, frankly, my expectations of the food uh, going in were not real high because this is such a popular tourist attraction and a lot of times tourist attractions can disappoint because they don't have to serve good food. Tourists aren't coming back. They come once and then they go back home and, you know, they don't care. This place, the food lives up to the reputation. So, uh, gotta say, nice place. I would recommend coming here. But as always, uh, you know, make those reservations in advance. Like I said before, two months, um, they are completely booked out. All right, so now we're gonna hop back in our uh, time machine and uh, go back and finish up our nice little trip here in uh, Almada. Well, they'll do it for today's video in Almada. We're finishing up at the Feral de Casillas, and this is the lighthouse of Casillas. Um, this lighthouse has been deactivated for a long time, so it's not used as a navigation beacon per se, but it's a cool landmark, so I thought this would be a nice place to finish our video. And I got to say, I didn't know what to expect when we came to Almada today. I've been here a few times, but I really didn't know what it was going to be like as we dug a little bit deeper into the town. I knew I'd like the Cristo de Rey just because it's such an imposing, impressive monument. But some of the other stuff that we came across was just fantastic. That abandoned winery was mind-blowing. I love that. We had some great food too, and everywhere you go, there's these fantastic views, and the April 25th bridge is everywhere, <laughs> just kind of sitting there in the background all the time um, as a reminder of how close you are to Lisbon. 15, 20 minute ferry ride, how can you go wrong? Sure, it gets a little busy with tourists, especially at some of the more popular restaurants, but I think it's worth it for half a day or even a day trip to come to Almada. And, I've been really happy with our trip today. So um, that'll do it for this week. We'll have another video for you next week. Until then, like and subscribe to the video. And I'm Brent Peterson. I'll see you down the road.